welcome, uh, welcome for the night. Really appreciate everybody coming, and uh, hopefully you uh, get something out of out of, out of tonight and learn some uh, some things you can take home and make uh, things better for whether you're coaching or whether you're an athlete yourself. I see a lot of people in here I recognize and some I don't. So I'll introduce myself to start with. My name is Liam Donnelly. I'm the swim coach at Simon Fraser University. And I've been up there, about, I think it's my 23rd year. And uh, just to give you an idea of kind of what I'm working with at this point, it's varsity level athletes. So the athletes are 18, 18 years old up to about 23, 24. Uh, we're training nine sessions a week in the water, uh, two hours each time, and then we're doing additionally some dryland training on top of that, so it, I think it's five or six sessions of uh, strength training on top of it. Uh, the athletes that we have are competing at a junior national to a national and some at an international level, so pretty high level uh, swimmers. Uh, also we have a, a sister program that has some youth development, so we have some younger kids there and coaches working with that as well. Um, and I guess in the last uh, couple of years, we were always looking to make some improvements in our program. And I was approached uh, by Dr. Eric Ewell, who had just uh, moved here. He's working in Fortius, and uh, he is a medical practitioner, chiropractic. And he kind of approached me and said he'd like to come and work with our team, which was fantastic. So he's been now into his second year working with us. I think it's made a, a huge impact on what we're able to do. I think we're able to train more. Uh, we're able to train smarter, we're able to train better, and more effectively. And uh, we're doing that because uh, I think some of the practices that we're doing are uh, modernizing, so to speak. And, uh, you know, we're taking what we are learning from science and putting it, uh, applying it practically. So I'm happy to be here as a co-presenter, but uh, really and truly your presenter is Dr. Eric Ewell. And I'll uh, introduce Thanks. Dr. Eric Ewell. All right, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, as uh, Liam said, I, I do work here at Fortius. I'm a chiropractor, and uh, I do have a background in swimming. When I was growing up, I swam in Ontario for uh, Trent Swim Club in uh, Peterborough, and uh, reached the national level there, and then I competed at university as well, and uh, competed at CIs. I uh, enjoyed that, and uh, did some master swimming too, and uh, had a lot of fun with that. Uh, for a brief period, I was also uh, into coaching. I was uh, the head coach at Queen's University for uh, two years, and I had my level two coaching. So I've been swimming for a while, and uh, this is a great talk for me because I get to uh, combine my two passions, which is uh, swimming as well as uh, biomechanics and therapy and uh, injury prevention. So uh, hopefully we can link, link them all together for you tonight. So, uh, so tonight we're, we're going to focus on uh, specifically biomechanics and shoulder injuries as it relates uh, to swimming, really, really focusing in on uh, the freestyle stroke and how, uh, whether you're an athlete or a coach, you hopefully develop some tips towards av avoiding shoulder injuries in the future. Just a quick little bit of background information on it uh, here for you. Uh, swimmers are not immune to injuries. As you can see, the most common injuries that, shoulder, that uh, swimmers tend to get are shoulder injuries, followed by knees and backs and others. Others tends to capture categories like uh, hips and ankles, things, things of that nature. As Liam mentioned, high-level athletes can be doing quite a bit of training in the water, not uncommon uh, to see them training 20 to 30 hours a week. And with that comes a lot of shoulder revolutions. And Liam and I were chatting the other day and uh, just trying to ballpark estimate what we thought. And uh, believe it or not, uh, a million revolutions was actually on the low end side of, of what we were figuring. So the shoulder is, uh, is uh, a great joint in the body. And uh, it's a joint that we have a lot of motion of. You know, we've got uh, uh, 360 degrees, which is fantastic. Anytime you have a, a joint that has uh, a lot of, uh, of motion in it, you have to sacrifice something. And typically with the shoulder, you tend to sacrifice stability. And that's going to be a, a theme that we sort of touch on throughout the presentation tonight. Uh, some of you might, I might be dating myself with this picture. Uh, this is Alex Bowman, uh, arguably the best uh, Canadian swimmer to come out. He actually uh, had a uh, shoulder injury when he was training at Indiana and uh, was able to persevere through it and came back and uh, won two gold medals at the uh, Los Angeles Olympics, I, I believe both in world record time too. So. Uh, 
quick little background on anatomy. Some of us might be uh, well aware of the shoulder anatomy. Others of us might need a little refresher of it. We're going to start with uh, the bones. This is actually a view of the back of the shoulder here. And uh, you can see we've got the collarbone here labeled, the scapula here, and the humerus. Looking at it from the front, we've got these same bones. Uh, some things that I want to highlight, though, for you is this part of the scapula right through here. This is called the acromion. And uh, these parts of the humerus right through here. These are uh, called the uh, tuberosities of the humerus. And you have a greater tuberosity and a lesser tuberosity. And the reason I highlight them is because they're going to be important later on in the presentation when we talk about reasons for impingement of shoulder, shoulder injuries. Reasons for impingement happen by this greater tuberosity coming closer to this acromion bone. And the stuff that's in between there gets squished and gets, becomes painful and irritated. Uh, not only is the shoulder compo composed of bones, but it's also composed of muscles as well. So, quick little review of our uh, rotator cuff muscles. Again, looking at it from the front, we've got our subscapularis muscle here, which sits on the front of the scapula. And on the back, we've got our other three muscles, which make up the four rotator cuffs. So, we've got our supraspinatus, which you can see from this image actually passes underneath that acromion bone. So, this is one of those muscles and tendons that tends to get pinched uh, when things become irritated. We've got the infraspinatus and then the teres minor. These four muscles together make up what's commonly called the rotator cuff. It's important to realize that the rotator cuff is not one structure. Often people will say, I've got a rotator cuff injury. That's great. That tells you the body part, but it doesn't tell you the actual muscles that, that's injured. And the reason <coughs> that that's important is each of these muscles has a different function. The supraspinatus is involved in internal rotation. Uh, the, sub, uh, sorry, the, the subscapularis is involved in internal rotation, the supraspinatus is involved in abduction, and your teres minor and infraspinatus are involved in external rotation. And with swimming, we're going to see swimming is a sport that actually leads to muscular imbalances. So some muscles you're going to use a lot when you swim, other muscles you're not going to use as much. Um, not only do we have these muscles that play a role in the shoulder, but they're also overlapped by some other major muscles. So, uh, your, your, your pectoralis major, uh, your latissimus dorsi through here, uh, your deltoids, all of these muscles actually overlay the shoulder as well and, and play a role in shoulder motion. Swimming is a sport that uh, we tend to rely on our, our adductors and our internal rotators. So those are uh, these muscles through here, our pectoralis major, our scapularis, our latissimus dorsi, and our teres major. Having an overdominance of these muscles with swimming is sometimes great. Uh, the latissimus dorsi, when you have a really developed latissimus dorsi, that's when you get that really nice triangular shape. People say, oh, I want that swimmer's body, that you've got nice big latch, you look like you're really in shape, um, and, and you have that fit, sleek physique. Having other, other muscles uh, become overworked or, or, or tight, such as the pectoralis major, that tends to lead to the shoulders actually rounding in and having that rounded posture where people say, why do swimmers always stand like this, right, with their, with their uh, shoulders rounded forward? We'll talk a little later about how um, these muscles can actually affect your posture and how your posture can actually predispose you to injury in your shoulder. Other muscles uh, that we've got as well that aren't so important uh, to swimming but are, are still important muscles nonetheless and that perhaps you should be thinking about trying to, to balance out and perhaps doing, doing some exercises for these muscles uh, to, to even out what, what swimming uh, uh, captures for these. Our uh, supraspinatus, our infraspinatus, our teres minor, our deltoids, and our, and our trapezius uh, muscle in through there. Um, the next part of anatomy I want to talk about that people might not, might not be aware of, or, or maybe you are, but, uh, but we're, we're just going to touch on it briefly, is uh, fascia. The reason I bring it up is because there's, there's been a bit of a, a shift in the thinking uh, recently for anatomy. We used to think that uh, muscles traveled to bone and then stopped. And then you'd have one muscle stop and then the next muscle start. But actually, um, a, a while ago, uh, Myers uh, uh, hypothesized that we actually have uh, these fascial chains which run the whole length of the body. And fascia is a connective tissue just like muscles are connective tissue, and just like bone is a connective tissue, which actually links everything together. So it's not that your, your, your um, muscle comes into your tendon, and your tendon goes into your bone and everything stops, but actually what happens through anatomy and what they've discovered through histology is that 
uh, you have a gradual transition of those fibers. So you have a transition zone where muscle turns into tendon. You have a transition zone where the tendon turns into bone. And overlying it all is fascia. Fascia uh, helps to have that transition from the muscle uh, into the bone. And the reason why that's important to us is we're going to talk a little bit later how uh, fascia can actually have an influence on uh, your technique and your posture. And fascia itself has some components, uh, such as an elastic component, which we can actually harness through swimming technique if we, if we think about actually uh, incorporating our role. And we'll, we'll get into that a, a little bit too. So this... This idea of fascia, again, uh, these are some dissections. This actually shows, this is actually someone's foot in through here and their plantar fascia traveling up through their gastrocs, through their hamstrings, into their sacrotuberous ligament, into their erector muscles, all the way up to the top of their head. One continuous connection, all right? So what that basically means is what I'm doing down on my toe can affect the tension that happens in my neck, all right? And you can see another dissection in through here in terms of the back and it running all the way to the fingertips. And these are in relation to these fascial planes. So if we want to, how does this relate to swimming, you might be asking? Well, a really simple example is what, what is your head position doing when your arms are moving, right? So if my head is down like this and I'm burying my head in the water and I can only get my arm this high, but if I lift my head up, I can maybe gain another half an inch. It doesn't sound like much, but if you can get a half an inch on every single stroke, it's going to add up to, to significant gains over the long term. And we'll, we'll talk a little later about how um, stroke rate and stroke length are pretty much your, your main determinants for how fast you're going to be going in the water. Those two variables. Okay, so let's chat a little bit about injuries. En enough uh, background stuff. <coughs> uh, swimmer's shoulder. What is it? What are we talking about? What if Someone comes in to you and they say, Coach, Coach, I, I, I went and I saw you. He says, I got swimmer's shoulder. What, what's he talking about there? Traditionally, swimmer's shoulder, it's a, it's a bit of an, uh, an ill-defined uh, condition synonymous with rotator cuff tendinopathy. Again, that might tell us a little bit more, but rotator cuff, top ten, rotator cuff tendinopathy doesn't tell us the whole story. Which rotator cuff is involved um, and, and how bad is that injury? And also with the tendinopathy, um, is it, uh, is it a, a, a new uh, inflammation of that tendinopathy? Is it a chronic inflammation of that tendinopathy? Is it a tendinopathy of something that's getting impinged? Or is it a tendinopathy of a structure uh, that's not getting impinged and not, not having an issue? There are um, various other uh, things that can actually lead to uh, pain in the shoulder, not, not just in the swimmer, but this goes for uh, people who might actually uh, present with uh, shoulder injuries in general and shoulder pain in general. So uh, the neck can, can uh, play a role in shoulder pain. The brachial plexus, which is actually, which is actually the, the neurovascular bundle that feeds the whole upper limb through here. If you get a pinch in through that, that can manifest as shoulder pain and also things happening further down, so down into the hand as well. The AC joint is, uh, is a short form for the acromioclavicular joint. Um, which can, can also play a role. And then we've got some other things which are, are, are a little more uh, systemic or comorbidity things. So, so arthritis can, can result in shoulder uh, injuries uh, or shoulder pain. Tumors again and infections, scarier stuff. This isn't really the stuff that you've got to be worrying about in terms of trying to figure out yourself or with your athletes. It, these are the things that uh, as uh, practitioners and physicians, you know, we should, we, it's up to us to, to figure out which is the result and, and which of these is is uh, the true cause of their pain. Once you eliminate all the scary stuff, then we, then we have uh, shoulder injuries. So looking at, at those a little quicker again, cervical spine, cervical radiculopathy, how does it relate uh, into, into shoulder pain? Uh, perhaps through uh, disc injuries or uh, spinal thesis, which is a shifting of the, uh, the bones of, of the spine to, so they're not lined up perfectly anymore, uh, can result in uh, radicular pain or referred pain to the shoulder area. As we mentioned, that, that brachial plexus as well can become impinged. So you can see it crossing right under this clavicle bone right through here. Uh, this part, this coracoid process of the scapula, has some muscles that attach to it and run over here, which can pinch on the brachial plexus. I've actually treated uh, a few swimmers who have had this, uh, this specific uh, injury where uh, they get a condition which is called thoracic outlet syndrome. So they've got uh, tightness in the front of the shoulder 
which is causing their pain and their, their shoulder pain and also radicular symptoms. And uh, for some people, if it doesn't get figured out, it, it can be a career-ending injury, right? It, it's something that, that they can't quite swim through. The acromioclavicular joint, um, if you ever sustain injury through this, so if you had a, a shoulder separation, that joint doesn't, doesn't heal properly, you can wind up with a, a little bit of uh, degeneration in the joint and osteophytes. If you have osteophytes, they can actually help to, to decrease that space again and cause pinching of all the structures that are going to travel through here. Again, arthritis, don't worry too much about rheumatoid arthritis versus Stills disease and, and, and Mary Strumpel's disease. Uh, again, just be aware of that, that we all know the knees and hips can get arthritis. The shoulder joint can also get arthritis. And perhaps this isn't something for our uh, younger athletes, but it's definitely something uh, that might be a consideration for master's level athletes. Last two, again, tumors. You don't have to go home and lose sleep about maybe your shoulder is a tumor. It's probably not, okay? Uh, I just raise it in, in there in that there are, there is the odd, very rare case. Typically happens in younger kids before they're, um, they're, they're done growing and before their growth plates close that, that are subjected to some of these tumors, uh, such as like Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma. Uh, but it is a differential. And then the last one is infection. Infection, again, you don't have to worry about it too much. There would be some signs, again, uh, you know, associated fever, uh, was playing with the family cat or dog and, and had a slight bite uh, in the shoulder or got scratched, something to that effect. Uh, it really is really, really a rare, rare case where you're going to have an infection of the shoulder joint. Let's talk a little more specifically about swimmer's shoulder now. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, physiological laxity. So, uh, the biomechanics of swimming actually require a large degree of physiological laxity of the shoulder. And so it's been argued that uh, perhaps one of the reasons swimmers tend to have laxity in the shoulder is maybe those swimmers who are really, really good, um, maybe they have a little bit of genetic laxity to begin with, they enjoyed some success in the sport, and so they continued on with it. People who were a little more stiff, weren't able to quite have that range of motion, didn't have as much success, so they decided, ah, oh, tag with us and we go play hockey. And uh, so there's some argument saying, ah, oh, maybe the sport kind of self-selects for those people um, that, uh, that have extra laxity in their shoulder. As well, um, the sport itself is going to contribute to increased laxity in the shoulder joint. You do a million revolutions of your shoulder over the course of the year, you're going to wind up with extra laxity in your shoulder. Yeah? Sorry, so what's laxity? Is that flexibility or...? Uh, yeah, but I would even say laxity is uh, flexibility beyond the normal range. So if you took a cross section of the normal range, uh, laxity is just a little bit of extra flexibility that's, that, that hasn't gone to an injury state, mm -hmm. um, but, but it's past the normal range. And so often uh, we think about the, the spectrum of physiological laxity and we think, you know, you're in the green, you're great, we all want to be in the yellow, we'd like to be optimal, we'd have to, like to have a little bit of extra laxity, uh, but we don't want to be pathological, we don't want to have so much laxity that causes problems. But, uh, which is what I think Baldwin was, I think he was subluxing, his shoulder was moving right out of the joint, and that's, that's off the other side of the chart, because we do want the mobility in your shoulder, it's a huge advantage. But. Absolutely, yeah, so you want... Uh, excellent point. And you want to walk that, uh, that fine line, right? Perhaps the spectrum actually looks a little more like this, where the difference between uh, optimal laxity and pathological laxity is actually quite narrow, right? And it's easy to slip into, into injury. Um, what happens when there is too much laxity? Well, <coughs> then you have instability, instability of the joint. Uh, in terms of shoulder instability, you can actually add... There's two main kinds of shoulder instability. There's traumatic shoulder instability, which comes from a traumatic event, such as your shoulder dislocating. And then there's um, atraumatic instability, which comes from repetition. So we see it a lot in overhead athletes. Not only in swimmers, you see it a lot with uh, throwing athletes, so baseball pitchers. Uh, how many of us have seen a picture of a baseball player where they're, they're cocking and their arm is actually down somewhere like this because they've got that extra motion, that extra laxity in through there? Perhaps they're even a little unstable, right? By the time you can you can bend your arm back like this. Again, it's the, the demands of their sport though that require them to do that. And, and, and perhaps you wouldn't, I can't throw a 95 mile an hour fastball, right? And, and perhaps you need to be able to do that in order to do it. 
Um, with instability of the shoulder comes problems. And with instability, it puts you at risk for um, uh, impingement issues. And, uh, and uh, yeah? Just a quick question about the laxity in younger servers. Mm -hmm. Because of growth, yeah. can you get periods of more laxity? And yeah. that's when you get injury too, because we, we get a lot of that with kids. Absolutely. Like young, like I'm talking nine. Yep. To 13 girls especially. Yes, and so and okay. you took the next words rated in my mouth. Females are a little more prone prone to it than males, uh, and uh, and you can. Uh, what what can affect uh, the laxity of ligaments in the body? Hormones. Yeah. All right. As your as your systemic hormones change, the laxity of your ligaments change. The easiest example that most people can relate to actually is pregnancy. When you're pregnant, the body releases a hormone literally called relaxin. The whole point of that hormone is to make the ligaments more relaxed so you can give birth. So, so you can definitely see those changes uh, in those athletes for sure. Um, okay, let's just, so what am, I, what am I trying to say with all this? Well, essentially, uh, again, we go back to this, this space in through here, this subacromial space uh, that we've got. It's not empty. In reality, it's full of things. So within this subacromial space, we have our supraspinatus tendon. We also have our bicep tendon coming up, and we have a bursa as well. So that, that subacromial space is naturally full of anatomical structures. If we take our shoulder and we internally rotate it, we're just naturally, so internal rotation is tur turning our, our shoulder in, we're turning our thumb towards our ground turning our thumb towards the ground. That's going to be a theme that you'll constantly hear me talk about tonight in terms of uh, proper technique, think entry, think, things like that. We don't want to be entering thumb first. Uh, what, the reason for that is uh, turning our thumb towards the ground turns our humerus such that our greater tuberosity now is decreasing our subacromial space naturally. All right? So you don't want to do that. And you definitely don't want to do it repetitively and thousands upon thousands of times. If you do, you end up pinching something, right? Hence, hence the, the, the diagnosis often of impingement. So things get irritated, things get, get annoyed. Um, as well, this, this long head of the biceps, <coughs> we have, uh, perhaps we're actually entering properly and we're doing techniques properly, but perhaps we have a little bit of extra laxity in the joint and things aren't staying, staying properly in that joint. You get a little bit of shifting that humeral head, you can start to pull on the long head of your biceps. Very, very common in swimmers to get long irritation of the long head of their biceps because they don't have the stability in the joint and the congruency of the joint. Anytime you don't have stability of the joint, you really have two options. You can strengthen it or you can have surgery. All right? You really don't want to be promoting a whole lot of surgery if you don't have to to go through it. Uh, so your option is to strengthen it. And we'll get, we'll get into that uh, later on when we talk about what are the specific muscles we should be strengthening and what are some some ideas of exercises that we should be doing. Um, so we touched on this briefly, the idea of uh, muscular imbalance uh, being important in uh, swimmer's shoulders. Certain muscles play only a minor role, our external rotators, so our teres major, our teri, or, or, sorry, our teres minor and our infraspinatus. Other muscles play a major role in, in propulsion and swimming, our adductors and our internal rotators. So, so what am I trying to say with that? It's the muscles that you use when you do this that are involved in the major motion of swimming. So what is that? I'm doing adduction, right? And I'm doing a little bit of internal rotation when, when we swim to you. Do a little bit of internal rotation. So if you remember that list of muscles again, uh, the ones that we're going to use a lot, we're going to use our, our pectoralis major or minor. We're going to use our subscapularis. Uh, we're also going to use our latissimus dorsi. These are the major muscles that we're going to use for propulsion in swimming. The muscles that we don't use so much these are the ones that we end up having an imbalance with. So the research has actually shown that in aquatic athletes, you see a shift in those strength ratios. Your adductors and internal rotators are stronger than your abductors and your, your external rotators. This can then lead to pathological shifting of the joint. So what does that say? It basically says if these muscles, these major propulsion muscles get tight, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tighten me forward. I'm now going to naturally sit in a bit of a closed position. My shoulders are going to round forward. They're going to round down. And I'm going to actually sit in a bit, bit of a closed position in through there. So, again, just to sort of illustrate that, we get this imbalance between those muscles. We end up with a natural posture that then 
maybe I don't have an injury, but if I stand like this and walk like this and talk like this and sit like this, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a ticking time bomb for injury. Maybe not my shoulder, but maybe somewhere else in my low back or in my neck as well. That's going to cause a decrease in our subacromial space. Are these some of the things that are also reinforced by the fact that the digital age has put everybody into that posture oh, yeah. naturally? Absolutely, yeah. So again, with the, we live in the computer age, uh, almost next to impossible to find someone who doesn't at some point have to interact with the computer. If you're someone who has to sit at a computer for eight to nine hours a day, it, it's literally that, right? You lean forward, you get a head, head shift forward, the shoulders round forward. Um, we typically say if, if you have a, a sedentary job where you have to sit lots, you really don't want to be sitting statically for longer than 30 minutes, right? That tends to be where things shut off. Your core muscles shut off, your postural muscles shut off, you start to hang <coughs> on your ligaments, you start to develop bad posture, you get irritation of the joints. So every 30 minutes, you don't have to get up and go for a, for a walk or anything, but just get up, adjust your posture, and then reposition and sit down again. Um, so if we, have, if we have this posture, we can naturally have, again, irritation of that, of that subacromial space. Uh, and later on, we'll talk about walking around posture isn't just important, but swimming posture is important too. How you are in the water is important as well. Uh, okay, so to sort of summarize up what, what I've been going on about here, um, instability, laxity, and muscular imbalances or perhaps some of the causes uh, of uh, common shoulder complaints in, in athletes. So it's not necessarily that just, oh, you've got tendonitis. Let, let's fix up that tendonitis and you'll be fine. If you fix up the tendonitis, that's great. They might be fine for a week, a month, whatever. It's not going to be the end of the story, though. You, you really need to look at uh, how do we create more stability in that joint? How do we correct these muscular imbalances? All right? Laxity, there's maybe some things you can do, maybe not. What, what your philosophy is with it. Um, and so again, with these things, these are the things that end up causing your, your impingement syndrome, your rotator cuff issues, your subacromial bursitis, and your labral tears, right? So th these are secondary symptoms of what's happening in through here. So let's look a little bit about uh, biomechanics now. So the biomechanics of swimming and how it does uh, swimming actually lead us to, to causing impingement, causing uh, rotator cuff tears, labral issues, these, these sorts of injuries. Um, there, are, there are a few key factors that you can, you can uh, uh, use to, to influence performance or improve your performance. The one that we're going to talk about tonight is, is biomechanics. Genetics absolutely plays a role in your performance. Your training, your practice, your technique does, as well as uh, prevention and treatment of injuries and aging. Any one of these you can do a full talk on. We're just going to focus strictly on the biomechanics portion today. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to focus on the freestyle tonight. It doesn't matter whether you're a breaststroker, a butterfly, or a backstroker. The vast majority of your training will be done doing freestyle. It's just what we use to log all our meters. And, 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 uh, and you do it when you're warming up, when you're warming down. Uh, often, you can't swim butterfly for a full main set. Well, some of Liam's athletes can, but I sure can. And, uh, and so you mix in some freestyle, right? So you end up do, doing a lot of freestyle. Uh, there are five phases uh, to the freestyle. You've got your hand entry, your catch, your pull, your finish, and your recovery. I list two other things here, uh, head position and trunk rotation, because we're going to talk about them and how they play a role uh, throughout some of these various courses. I also... Pick this picture as well, uh, Ryan Cochran here, because this is this is a, a, an excellent picture in here. There's a reason he's our he's our poster boy for swimming Canada right now. He's won a couple Olympic medals. He's a distance athlete, nonetheless as well. He has very very good technique. Nice high elbow in through here. Uh, his uh, hand and his elbow almost in a lot uh, perfect line in through here. Um, these are things that we're going to chat about as, as we move along. Okay, so hand entry. Things to think about with your hand entry. When you enter the water, you actually want to think about your hand and your elbow and your shoulder all entering through the same hole in the water. The reason for that is, uh, anytime we're moving through the water, if I, my hand is entering instead through an oval shape, it means I'm creating resistance for myself as I travel through the water. So this is just, just pure physics, right? You want to have, enter your hand fast and you want to enter it into that perfect spot so you can start your catch. 
If you have a nice, lazy entry and your hand's sort of drifting along, your hand is going to create resistance on the back surface here and through the back of the forearm. So you want to have a nice, uh, crisp entry in through there. Uh, and basically your entry goes until, you're, until you uh, reach your full extension through here. We talked about um, already there are some important aspects of, ent of uh, entry. So what do we want to be thinking about with entry in order to avoid injury to our shoulders? Far and away is what your hand looks like when it enters the water. Sometimes you'll see people entering thumb first. I mentioned before already, if your thumb is down, you're decreasing your subacromial space, right? The, the greater tuberosity is now bumping up against the acromion, so you're causing impingement. You do that a thousand times in a workout, you're just creating a recipe for irritation, for strain in through those structures through there. What you want to think about is having a flat hand entry so you can get your hand in through there and you're not causing uh, internal rotation or impingement of your shoulder. The next, uh, the next uh, phase that we want to talk about is the catch. So the catch is uh, traditionally what people just call feeling the water, right? You want to, you want to get your hand, hand in, you want to have, have feel the water, and you want to start your pull. Uh, it involves uh, flexing the, the wrist and the hand. Uh, it's basically what you're trying to do. You're trying, during your catch, you're trying to create the biggest paddle that you're going to use to pull your body along, okay? So a couple of things to, to think about during the catch in order to, to um, improve your performance and to avoid injury. Number one is, uh, what's your head position during the catch? Your catch is going to set you up for your pull. What, what you're doing in your catch, it's very rare that during, when I start the catch, I'm going to be like this. And when I uh, finish the catch, I'm going, to, I'm going to move my head all around and, and do something else. You pretty much get locked in and try to, try to generate your power. So head position and trunk rotation are important. As I already mentioned, the head position in the catch is very important. If you have your head down too low, we talked about how uh, those fascial chains are, are possibly going to restrict you a little bit. And that, that difference of an inch on every catch is going to make the difference in your stroke length, which is going to add up to meters over the course of, of a race, right? Um, as well, if your head is, is up too high uh, during the catch, you're going to create a lot of resistance. If you have a high head, your hips are going to sink, and you're going to essentially plow through the water. So you want to have a, a nice uh, neutral head position, uh, not too high, not too low, that's going to that's gonna allow you uh, to, to have a, a nice clean uh, catch, which is going to help with your pull. As well, uh, you want to make sure that you're rolling into your catch. So by rolling, what I mean by that is we want to roll, have a nice roll, turn into the body, right, in, right from our catch, not only through our pull. It starts in the catch. So if I have my catch here, the first thing that I want to do is roll with my body back. If I can use that stored elastic potential in the fascial chains, you're essentially using free energy through here. You don't have to have the muscles work for you. You can get the anatomy of the body to start to pull in the rebound for you. As well, if you can start to use your trunk muscles and your core muscles after your catch, when you first start to pull, it saves your shoulders a lot of work to do at the beginning there. <coughs> Why would I want to use my rotator cuffs, which are these small, measly muscles, when I can use my obliques, my lats, my abs instead, which are a lot bigger muscles, to generate my power, okay? So if you can, st if you can, if you can have a nice clean roll and incorporate some of your core uh, into, your, into your technique, uh, that as well will decrease your risk of injury because the shoulder, those small shoulder muscles aren't going to get tired as quickly. Can I just, I just want to interrupt here, right? When he said this is so important on the head position, and he talked about um, uh, neutral, I think it was, it was the terminology used. So neutral head position would be, and good posture too. So standing here now, I would say I've got as good a posture as I can have, uh, but my head is in a neutral position, and this is a neutral position. So if you're the bottom of the pool right now, I would be in this position. I should be relatively down. Okay, a lot of swimmers will want to look forward to see where they're going. That's a non-neutral position. So you're automatically going to be in a bad position. So you do need to see where you're going when you're swimming freestyle. I, I encourage people to look out of the tops of their goggles, look as little forward as possible, and to try to maintain looking, keeping their head down as low as possible to stay in that position, not this position. Does that make sense? Now, burying your head the other way is extremely unusual. So it's usually trying to find themselves in that neutral position. The second is, 
And I know uh, Dr. Yo showing his arm, arm in here with his head up because he's talking to you. But really, if you're at the bottom of the pool and I'm swimming, I'm swimming this way. Uh, my head is in a neutral position. My arm's going to be up here. Okay. So if he's saying you got your thumb in first, that is really a poor, poor position for your shoulder, right at the at the height of your stroke. And typically, also you've got your head underwater, so your ears, the water is usually sitting here. So the rotation is really important. When you put your hand in, ideally flat, or I try to encourage people to put their little finger in first because that's really hard to do. But they'll end up going flat even if they're getting close. You'll want to rotate your trunk and get the hand in deep. Like when you see this picture in here when they're starting their catch and the water surface is right here, this hand is, is well down underwater. And I, I'm not sure why, but a lot of swimmers they'll put their hand in and they'll press down. So again, if you're the bottom of the pool, I'll put my hand in here, I'll press down. And the reason why people do that is because they, it's, I think, a natural instinct to want to keep your head above the water. You know, if you can just, you know, this is why I know when you start off with kids, you blow bubbles and all that, you get them used to getting their head in the water and just being in the water. When you're talking about a neutral position in the water, that's the most important thing to start with, your body position. When your hand goes in, it has to, you have to rotate, and your hand will have to be 8 to 10 centimeters underwater. Okay, and if you're, and if you're higher than that, you've got your hand higher than your shoulder. And if you've got your thumb in first, you're in a really poor, poor position. And if that's how you're swimming, that, that needs to change. Or if you, if you see swimmers swimming that way, that needs to change. Deeper on their entry, they go in deep, and then they can go into their catch position. Position. Sorry. That's okay. No, great. Um, there are some there are some things available too. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later too about this. Um, if, if you've got someone working on head position and and, and body position and roll, uh, snorkels are are really in vogue right now, right? It allows you to, to be able to set that perfect head position to work on that and then work on your roll uh, in, in through that from, from that from that nice head position. Um, so there are there are things that you can use out there. Uh, after our catch, what comes next? The pull. Uh, when I was when I started swimming back in the 80s, uh, we were taught, you know, you want to make this nice half a keyhole shape, right? You want to have you want to have nice surface area. It's all about the surface area that you can create when you swim. That's sort of been disproven now. What you want to do is you want to get your hand into the water. You want to get your hand deep. And again, it has to without getting too much into the physics of it. Uh, when I'm swimming through the water, I, I create a current, right? So the water near my body is moving. If I want to try to create a pull through moving water, I'm not going to create as much force if I can use my hand on water that's still, all right? So you, the stiller water is going to be further away from you, all right? So a deeper, a deeper pull, you're going to be able to generate more power with a deeper pull with your hand further away from your body. So the other thing as well, um, with, uh, so depth is thought to be more important than creating that S pattern. The other thing as well is that S pattern promotes internal rotation again, right? If I'm swimming and I, and I, and I, and I want to not internally rotate, I'm going to put my hand like this. I ain't going to get very far if I'm trying to cut through the water like this, right? So what do I do to feel the water? I turn my hand in so I can feel the water, push it out. That's a lot of force on the shoulder, right? That's sweeping out through there in the freestyle. A lot of force through there. Uh, so we, we try not to, to promote too much of that, that S shape anymore, uh, especially for, for elite level athletes. It's about getting into the water, good clean hand entry. Get your catch, deep water, and pulling underneath your body. The hand will, as you get closer to your finish, the hand is going to travel up towards your body again. Um, but you do, you do want to see depth to the water. The hand is not flowing through all at one, one level anymore. Uh, you're, try, you're trying to, 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 to use uh, that still water to propel yourself forward. Uh, anything on the forward? No, that's okay. good. Okay. Uh, the finish. Um, finish is, some would argue actually that the finish is, is one of the most important parts of the stroke, right? And again, the reason for that is uh, stroke length. If, I, if I'm not finishing, you, you want to try to finish past your hip, and if I start to, to get tired and I'm not finishing past my hip anymore, again, instead of inches, I could be shortening my stroke length by several inches, right? 
and, and, and you're, you're really doing yourself a, a disservice if, if you are, are shortening your finish. Um, so the finish is, is, is basically uh, as you're traveling from the deepest part, you're coming through, and it's right, right before the hand exits the water. I would, say, I would add to that, though, that uh, I think the finish is the is is the underemphasized part of swimming, and it should be much more emphasized. Uh, the a lot of people think they are pulling themselves through the water, so they swim out in front when you're impinged, and you're also you're actually weaker when your arms are over your head. You're weaker once your arms once your elbows get past your shoulders. You're stronger. If you've positioned your hand well, I mean, I really try to teach people to get into the water and just don't even put any pressure on the water. Because if you're putting pressure, you're probably pushing yourself, pushing down, pushing yourself up, which is A, wasted energy, um, it's inefficient, and it's, it's, in, it's when your shoulder's in an impinged position. So if you can get your elbow and your hand facing backwards, get your hand and your palm facing the opposite wall, and then push yourself. That's going to be your highest level of efficiency. It's also once you get past the elbow, past your shoulder, your strong, your body's in a strong position. So you want to you want to emphasize that catch and push and push hard. And if you can think about this, um, it's almost like swimming with nothing in front of you. And most people always want to swim with a hand in front of them. Always do. Kids uh, doesn't matter what age. They always want to swim and have something out in front of them. I'm not sure why. But the most efficient way is just to swim with, with nothing out in front of you. Just push. And if you have your head in the right position, your body's neutral, and you're swimming in the water, you're, and you've got a small kick going to keep your hips raised, and you're up at the surface of the water like a kayak. If you push a kayak, it just goes right down the pool. So if you can get your body into that position and just concentrate on pushing yourself, <coughs> you're going to go pretty pretty well. It'll be efficient, fast, and safe for your body. Absolutely. And, uh, and again, just like, just like, again, the, the major theme again, you don't want to be exiting that water thumb first. We all try, you'll sometimes see people and they'll be flicking and you'll see that they've got their thumb now pointed towards the ceiling when they finish. That's a, again, I've internally rotated my shoulder and now I'm actually putting a lot of torque through there as well. <coughs> again, you don't, you probably don't want to be entering, or sorry, exiting the water exiting the water pinky first either because you're probably slipping and you're losing those those last few inches as well so a flat hand when you have your finish flat hand exiting the water uh, we're just going to take a quick little uh, sidebar here to talk about uh, your finish and uh, and how it relates specifically we can all appreciate how it relates to stroke stroke length right um, I mentioned before, your speed is going to, it's literally going to be a, um, a, a formula between your stroke rate and your stroke length. Yeah, you can have a monster kick, but uh, not many of us can kick 100 meters faster than we can pull it, right? <coughs> it's it's your pull that's going to generate your power. So, elite, what separates uh, elite from novice swimmers is this ability to have a longer stroke length while maintaining the same stroke rate, all right? So, what does that basically mean? It means you're trying to to have as few lengths, or sorry, as few strokes per possible to get you down the pool. All right. Um, if you want to increase speed, you can you can increase either variable. Uh, most often, what elite swimmers do is they'll increase the stroke rate and keep the stroke length the same. So we just talked about that in terms of turnover, right? Increase your turnover, right? Um, if you if you have good technique, you're going to be maintaining your finish and your stroke rate is going to be your stroke length is going to be the same and then you increase your turnover, and that's how you're going to move faster through the water. People who are at a little more novice level of swimming will sh actually shorten their stroke length because they, they think it, it's faster to, to increase their, their, their stroke rate that way by, by, by getting around faster. Not necessarily the case. So you really want to make sure that you're, you're actually focusing on stroke length as well. Um, okay. Uh, last... Uh, last phase of, uh, of our stroke is our recovery. Um, obviously, it occurs uh, from the point where our hand leaves the water to, to when it enters again. You hear it all the time, you want a nice high elbow with the recovery, right? Why do you want a high elbow? Again, it's going to lower your risk of shoulder injury. Not only that, if I have a high elbow, I'm going to be rotated in the water again, right? 
my elbow is low, I'm probably swimming very flat. And if I'm swimming very flat, it means I have to make changes to my recovery, to what I'm doing with my arm. So trunk roll, very important to avoiding internal rotation. So if I'm flat and I'm swimming through the water very flat, uh, like this guy, um, I've got a couple options. I can, I can look up, I can lift myself up, I can try to, to elevate my body out of the water to, to help with my recovery. That's really inefficient. You'll get really tired really fast uh, swimming that way. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm staying very flat and I try to recover my hand, I can't necessarily do it. My hand's going to be in the water. So i got two options. I can turn my hand back and internally rotate and pull up, or I can, I can try to recover with my hand forward. Neither of these are, are, are very good. Again, if we turn our hand back, we're internally rotating, we're decreasing that subacromial space, we're causing impingement. If I turn my hand up and pull up uh, like this, it's a lot of torque just specifically on the supraspinatus, all abduction. Supraspinatus, again, is one of those muscles that's weak in swimmers. It's, it's not used very often. It's one that's, that's a risk factor and prone to injury. So what do we want to do instead? When we recover, we want to make sure we have a nice uh, roll with us and a relaxed position with a nice high elbow as we, as we recover through. Okay. Uh, okay, so what, is it, what does it all uh, look like when we put it all together here? <clears throat> so, um, this guy's uh, probably familiar to most people in the room. Michael Phelps, uh, probably considered best swimmer ever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just based on his uh, on his results. Um, so this is obviously showing a lot of things. We're getting this uh, a lot of different uh, views. So I chose this video because they, they show them from the top, from the side, in the front, from the bottom, and they slow slow it down so we can we can really appreciate what he's doing here. He also has a fantastic dolphin kick, which <laughs> no doubt helps his walls. <laughs> so this is a great one for seeing how deep his arm actually comes under the water here, right? Not close to his body at all. When it's when it's directly under his chest. He's a good two and a half feet underneath his body with his hand. So, so we're almost there. We talked about, talked about shoulders, talked about swimming biomechanics, talked about why shoulder injuries occur. Uh, now what, do we, what can we do for prevention wise, right? Aside, aside from the technique like we mentioned. A couple different things uh, that we want to uh, pay attention to. Uh, posture and technique, uh, correcting those muscular imbalances that we mentioned. Uh, and I, I threw stretching in here because everyone always asks about stretching. <laughs> So I figured I would just, just put it in and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get that out of the way. Uh, there is a right way and a wrong way to stretch. Okay, so the first one is uh, posture. As, as we already mentioned, uh, aquatic athletes sometimes are thought to have bad posture. Rounded shoulders, hyperkyphosis, which means just that sort of rounding of the back at the side, uh, forward head position. Uh, so one of the ways that we can avoid that is thinking about not only our swimming posture, but our daily posture, right? Standing up nice and tall, shoulders back, not only shoulders back, but shoulders back and down. This is going to open up that subacromial space and hopefully prevent uh, that, that um, chronic static uh, closing of it and that, that impinged, irritated state. Uh, as well, you definitely want to focus on proper swimming posture uh, to decrease stress to the shoulders. And as Liam mentioned, uh, Pro a lot of uh, proper swimming posture starts with a neutral head position. So we already talked about how um, 
uh, a snorkel can, can be advantageous for you in terms of uh, achieving that feel of what neutral, neutral head position is in the water and, uh, and, and remembering that. And, uh, and you're able to keep your head down and, and, and get through 10 or 12 strokes uh, without having to take a breath or rotate to the side. And uh, not only neutral head position, but as I mentioned, with the snorkel, um, one of the biggest things you got to remember to do with the snorkel is roll. Because you don't have to breathe anymore. Breathing will hopefully make you roll. But when you're swimming with the snorkel, you don't want to start to now swim flat. Always make sure you're, 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 you're keeping your roll uh, when you're swimming with the snorkel and, and not venturing into swimming flat. Okay, the snorkel swimming? That's good. That's good. Um, other, uh, other things, uh, equipment. Uh, equipment can, can help or hinder performance. It can also help or hinder injuries. Uh, if you have a shoulder injury or you, you, you feel like one's coming on, these are two things that you should probably drop right, right away. Flutter boards and uh, big ginormous paddles. Uh, again, flutter boards, uh, flutter boards are going to create a lot of extra strain on that shoulder and they're not going to put you into a very good position. What, what do we do when we're, we're typically kicking? We hang our bodies off the flutter boards and we relax and we put a lot of force through our shoulder. If we go back and we remember some of those beginning slides, swimmers are prone to instability of the shoulder. So if I have a little instability in my shoulder and I hang off, off my flutter board, it pushes my humeral head up again and drives it up into that subacromial space, puts a lot of strain on the biceps tendon. Uh, so flutter boards are not, not your friends if you have a shoulder injury. As well, our super large paddles, which I know are very in vogue now too uh, in using. Uh, again, they're just going to create a lot of extra excess torque uh, on the um, uh, rotator cuff muscles specifically and, uh, and lead you to, to uh, tendinopathies and, and other shoulder injuries. Okay, uh, muscular imbalance is, we mentioned before, Swimming is going to use uh, our adductors and our internal rotators. It's going to use our pecs and our lats and our, and our uh, subscapularis muscles. It's not going to use these muscles as, as well. So if we want to create stability in the shoulder again, we want to do some, a little bit of extra exercise for these muscles, which are underutilized in our sport, and, uh, and help to create balance in our, in our shoulder. Um, when I was a kid, we would, we would have tubing, and we would hook it up high, and we would just wail on that thing before practice every time. But we're going to get in the water and then do a thousand strokes anyways. It wasn't helping us in any sort of sense. I just did it because I was told to do it or because the other guy was doing it and he was fast, so I figured, hey. Uh, you do not need to be doing uh, tubing or resistance banding, mimicking your, your swimming uh, stroke. What's better is specific ones that are going to target your adductors, and your external rotators and your mid traps. Again, your mid traps are going to, what's going to help to, to balance out your pecs again. So these are just three examples, and there's a ton of ways that you, that you can work these muscles and different things that you can do. I just chose TheraBand uh, because we're all pretty familiar with TheraBand exercises. It's very easy. It's something that you can give your athletes again. They can take with them. It scrunches up into a tiny ball. They can keep it in their bag. It rolls up into something really smart, and they can pull it out, and they can do these um, uh, when they need to. Uh, the first one here is showing abduction, and I do have a slight problem with this first picture here again, with the hand being raised above the shoulder. Anytime you do that hand above the shoulder again, you're, you're, you're going to create um, increased uh, um, torque into that shoulder joint. If you have instability, it's going to drive the head of your humerus up into your acromion. So when we do abduction, we want to be thinking about doing it only, raising your hand only to the height of the shoulder, okay, when we focus on this one. You don't have to be wailing it up over to over above your head again. Uh, with all of these as well, you want to be doing it uh, with enough tens, uh, tensity or tensile uh, resistance in the TheraBand. So I'm working the muscles that I'm trying to work. So when I do abduction, I want to feel it in my supraspinatus and in my deltoid. I don't want to have to do abduction, so I have to recruit, so I have to recruit my trap, and I have to start to get a hip hinge and a hip swing and, and everything. If, if that's what you're doing. It's too, much, it's too much tension. Just, just lower the tension down so you can do it nice and smooth uh, throughout here. If you want to get really, really, really specific and um, really optimize this exercise, the best way to do it too is what's called in the scapular plane. So if I stand here, 
You, you, you would think my shoulder blades sit like this, but they don't. They sit next to the rib cage, and your rib cage is rounded. So your, rib, your shoulder blades actually sit at a 30 degree angle to your rib cage. So if I want to, want to do this exercise to optimize recruitment of my supraspinatus, a muscle that sits directly on my shoulder blade, I shouldn't be doing it directly out to the side, but I should do it, be doing it about 30 degrees uh, to, to the front of the horizontal there. And we, we just call that the scapular plane. So doing that exercise in the scapular plane is going to have more efficient recruitment of that rotator cuff muscle. Um, the next one down through here is an external rotation exercise. I do like this picture because they have a towel in through here. A towel, if you put something in through there, you're going to squeeze that towel so, you, so it's not going to fall down. Typically, again, when people have too much resistance when they're doing external rotation, then the elbow comes out and they start to recruit other muscles. So I start to recruit um, my rhomboids, I start to recruit my obliques again. By keeping a towel in through there that I've got to hold on to, uh, it forces me to actually isolate my external rotators a little more. So I can, I can start to specifically use those. The last one here uh, is, is, is literally just a mid-trap or rhomboid exercise where you want to think about uh, pulling this back in. Again, we want to do this with our good posture. So you start, you set up, stand up nice and straight. I have my shoulders back and down, and I pull this in. And then I pull, I pull that in. Really simple exercise. Sometimes people like to use the visualization of uh, you're trying to squeeze a, sh a quarter between your shoulder blades at the back, right? Try to, to close those shoulder blades together. Three really simple exercises that you can do to, to help restore balance in those muscles that, that uh, get underworked. Yeah. Um, just for the external rotation, I mean, in the picture, he's, um, he's supinated. Um, yeah. Is that going to be... Is that going to be different than he is in a neutral position in terms of recruiting? Yes, so you, yes, exactly. You've got a very keen eye, and you took the words right out of my mouth. When you start to bring in supination, you absolutely start to bring in the biceps brachii. And then I do a little thumb up, and, and none of this, none of this going from uh, pronation to supination and through there. But just thumb up. Is and that that's just uh, po possibly, and also that's one of the things again that we get that we do when we get a little lazy, right? You start to turn the wrist. You start to recruit other muscles again, and, and that's an excellent point there, that you do recruit the bicep brachii. You start to bring in that supination. Uh, okay, just the, the last few slides. You guys have been great. You're almost through. We're in, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, stretching. Um, I mentioned there's a right way to stretch and a wrong way to stretch before you train and absolutely before you race. Stratic, static stretching versus dynamic stretching. Static stretching is uh, passive stretching. It's typically what we think of when we think of stretching. Dynamic stretching is active stretching, and we'll talk about what that is. This is an example of static stretching, just, just hanging on there, holding that stretch. Another one. Um, I guarantee you, if you watch uh, people at the Olympics now, no one is static stretching behind the blocks anymore. If you watch the 100-meter sprint, uh, the 100 meters in track, you don't see anyone sitting down behind their blocks, stretching out their hamstrings before they go to run. What are they doing? They're bounding, they're jumping, they're doing explosive uh, exercises. All of those are forms of dynamic stretching. Why don't you want to do static stretching? Uh, it's been shown uh, in, in the research uh, that it possibly uh, causes neuromuscular inhibition, uh, reduces strength for up to 30 minutes, and causes a decrease in power of up to 5%. So if I'm standing behind the blocks, do I want to have a 5% reduction in power? Absolutely not. Should I be stretching my triceps like this? Absolutely not. Maybe I want to do something like this instead to stretch them. Maybe I want to do this instead. Maybe we should take a, um, a lesson from Michael Phelps. Everyone out, this is them, uh, I love this picture. Everyone's standing on the blocks. Everyone's heads down. Michael Phelps, every time if you watch him, he gets on the blocks. What does he do? He, he uh, wraps his arms here, and then he claps his hands behind his back. I can't even do it, um, but he can. That's literally a form of dynamic stretching. The guy is stretching on the blocks before he dives in the water. Everyone else is just standing there. He's getting in one last little bit. Why do we want to do dynamic stretching instead? It stretches the muscle, not only the muscles, but it also stretches the joints and the connective tissue. Remember what I talked about, that fascial tissue? tissue? Dynamic stretching stretches the fascial tissue, and, uh, and, and actually wakes it up to help harness that elastic potential that I talked about uh, tapping into before. 
As well, dynamic stretching is going to have a better recruitment of blood flow and oxygen to the tissue. It's going to prime it to work hard. Um, uh, it's going to help to increase power, flexibility, range of motion, all those fun things. You do want to do some sport-specific dynamic stretching, okay? So for, for swimmers, obviously some upper limb stuff. When you see soccer players now, they're often standing, kicking their legs up and back when you see them on the side uh, through here. Uh, so you want it to be more sport-specific for, for you in terms of your dynamic stretching. Uh, so to summarize it all up, static stretching might actually decrease athletic performance by decreasing your power. Uh, hasn't, hasn't been proven in the literature at all, static stretching, to prevent injuries. Um, I'm not saying static stretching is the devil. I'm just saying there's a right time to do it and a wrong time to do it. So you perhaps don't want to do it before you get on the blocks and race. If it was me in practice, I probably wouldn't even want to do it immediately before I jumped in the water to practice. After practice, if you're stiff and tight, absolutely, you can static stretch in the shower. Perfect time to do it. Uh, it's, and it, so it can help decrease stress and tension. It can be good for that if done at the appropriate time. Dynamic stretching, as we said already, increases power, flexibility, range of motion, increases blood flow and oxygen, and should be done in a sport-specific manner. And that's it. <laughs> Why is Phelps the only one doing that and no one else is? Good question. I don't know. Maybe we'll get a few more people doing that <laughs> uh, from here. Someone must have. Someone must have told me to do it. It might even just be part of his. It's part of his I was, ritual. I was going to say. I wonder if it was a natural. Yeah. Reaction it's, or reason. I, part. I guarantee you, he has. He has a ritual that he goes through before every race, right? And and so yeah. he's put that into into his uh, pre-race routine. Uh, he's he's an athlete that probably has everything monitored up until the time that he gets on the blocks, and and and, uh, and that's that's one of the things. That he does first. Yeah. Yep. Eric, with those exercises you were mentioning for the shoulder for shoulder injuries, getting our athletes back into action again after an injury, um, the importance of, of engaging the core in those workouts. And that illustration of the fascial plane from toe to head, you know, when we're, when we're retraining again, you've got to engage that whole fascial, fascial Absolutely. plane. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I only mentioned those, those three exercises again, uh, not necessarily as coming back from injury, but maybe more uh, incorporating into your routine to help balance out the, um, to help balance out what swimming naturally causes an, an imbalance for us. Uh, coming back from an injury, you're right. Perhaps a different set of exercises, and you're 100% right with engaging the core and having stability. It doesn't matter whether your stability for the back or shoulders or knees or hips, it all starts through the core, for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, if, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, you guys are uh, welcome to stay around and chat or, uh, or head out. I know it's a rainy night, people might, might need to get home. I think Joanna would want those forms. Yes, if you can, if you can fill out the forms here uh, and perhaps leave them at the back before you go. Uh, we're always looking to, to better these talks and these experiences here at Proteus. And, uh, and these forms are, are very valuable uh, feedback information for us.